Mark, I just wondered if, before we go on to talking about Jan Dielman and remembering Edinburgh at the time, if I could just welcome the idea of Cinema Rediscovered and your festival mm. uh, with just a few, perhaps rather theoretical, uh, I hope not too off the wall, remarks calling on um, Michel Foucault and his famous essay on other spaces. Because since I first talked to you and Steph on Zoom when we were preparing this, I was thinking more and more about how this, perhaps 2023 marks a year of security after the pandemic, when festivals can actually be back in real life. And um, our conversations just prompted me to think about um, heterotopias, uh, Foucault's idea of a heterotopia, as if a utopia is not a real space, it's an idea, whereas in a heterotopia is a real space that also encapsulates an idea. So it's in everyday life, but it's specifically separated from everyday life. It's a privileged space, and it's a space where people who are dedicated to a particular idea can come together. You might say it's a sacrosanct space, a sacred space, and many cinephiles would see festivals in those terms. So, but the important thing is that it's uh, when um, a, a number of people can, can divide themselves from the everyday, and what the festival organizer does is create a wonderful space in which the rhythm of life is turned into the rhythm of cinephil watching with events and so on. And of course, the, all the famous conversations in the bar and conversations over breakfast. So I just wanted to say that I feel that um, we can welcome back the film festival in the spirit of a real cinephile heterotopia, but also just to emphasize that with the rediscovered aspect, it also has a temporal side to it, because it means that the way in which uh, cinema has accumulated its history over the years can be celebrated, but also lost voices, forgotten voices. So the sense of rediscovered brings in the idea of an excavation of an archaeology, which is perhaps particularly relevant to women's uh, films and women's voices, who, if they do manage to express themselves, often just get lost into the myths, mists of the past. So I think this is a, a really um, a, a wonderful exploration of, uh, of um, through this space of cinema's history, cinema's temporality, and cinema actually is always a, as an exploration in many ways of time, which of course Jean Dielman, as we might talk about later, is an extraordinary uh, exemplary um, uh, film. I would just like to make, as, as it were, three last points, heterotopic-wise. Yeah. One is that as we could say the cinema itself is a heterotopic experience. We move into another world. Two, I think that the context of the festival, and particularly the way that you've evoked it, Mark, is a network of people who understand each other and who come together with a kind of common purpose. Mm. Um, whether they're exhibitors or distributors or critics or just movie fans. And, and so there is that sense of a collective passion that again takes them out of the ordinary into a shared world, um, a, a world of, of a shared space around a shared um, uh, passion. Um, so, and then the idea of the festival as a space of enjoyment and fun. And Foucault uh, evokes the museum as accumulating all the special works over time. So the idea of rediscovery is so important there. But then he also invokes fairgrounds and what it's like to go on the roller coaster of the fairground and bring that to the festival. But I just also wanted to carry on and kind of move on 
from uh, this to Edinburgh and um, say that perhaps um, Edinburgh in the 70s was perhaps particularly heterotopic and particularly exciting uh, because it was making a break, it was a radical festival. And I just f wanted to have a quick quotation from Peter Stanfield, who's actually studied Edinburgh. Uh, and as a starting point, he says, during the 1970s, the Edinburgh International Film Festival radically challenged the accepted idea of a film festival as a showcase for new releases, a benign cultural event designed to foster tourism and investment. So Edinburgh, under the directorship of Linda Miles, working with David Will and with Mummy Grigger, was in a sense a complete overthrow of that safe concept. And the festival moved into a discomfort area. And one of the ways it did that was by showing very, very challenging new films. It might also be worth remembering that it also did it by showing um, extraordinary retrospectives of the great directors of the studio system period who had fallen into neglect and had disappeared, uh, been forgotten since 19, late 1950s and this time, and as some of them were still around, they came along. And the great one for me was the 1972 Douglas Sirt retrospective, which coincided with another extraordinary moment in my uh, cin cinephile life, which was when Linda Miles, Claire Johnson and I organised the first women and film event, um, which <coughs> I, I feel set the tone um, retrospectively, at any rate, of the interest in women's cinema that was about to emerge during the, the 70s. I was aware that there was a new women's cinema emerging and it was being reflected in Edinburgh, but I'd first become aware of it. Uh, we're talking about Edinburgh 1974. I'd first become aware at a season organised by Simon Field and David Curtis at the National Film Theatre in 1973, which was a season of international experimental and avant-garde films. But within that season, I saw my first Yvonne Rayner film, Lives of the Performers, my first Joyce Wheeland film, Solidarity, um, and my first Chantal Ackerman film, uh, Hotel Monterey. Now, all of these films seem to be pointing in a new direction. Um, of course, there had been very important films made by women, really, since the beginning of cinematic time. But what was different was that the films, put it like this, in the past, films made by women, apart from the two Hollywood, Dorothy Ars and Ida Lupino, who were the great exceptions, either worked in art cinema or they worked in experimental kind of short films. What was so striking about these new films was that they were experimental features. They were long films. I mean, <clears throat> not necessarily as long as Jeanne Dielman, but they were extended experiments in women's lives, women's emotions, uh, and uh, other ways of seeing. And we might s insist on saying there was no essential feminine aesthetic or a essential way of seeing the world, but there were issues that male-dominated society were not, was not interested in, wouldn't be bothered to make a movie about, and we can come back to that in the context of Jeanne Dielman, but also other ways of seeing with cinema. And that was what was so striking. Um, the attempt to find a new language of cinema, which was also a counter cinema, so a challenge, a slap in the face to the cinema of uh, tradition and mainstream. And also just a tentative way of not necessarily falling back on an intuitive women's imagination, but working with the language of cinema itself and thinking about what is this language and how can it be changed around. Mm -hmm.
So I think that was important for that time because it wasn't a time in which, um, um, it was a time in which formalism, minimalism was really important. And so there's an interesting way in which this new women's cinema combined with a minimalism and a formalism. So it was absolutely prepared to work with the actual materiality of film, taking that from the avant-garde, but opening the, up to all this other stuff, as it were. Um, as Just to sum up, as Yvonne Reyna said, when she moved from dance to film, one reason for that was that she became interested in emotion. So this celebration of Hollywood directors wasn't, as it might seem now, uh, a celebration of, as it were, the great, well-known, uh, famous directors. It was actually an experiment in bringing popular cinema, which had been traditionally despised, particularly despised in English culture, and I say English advisedly, and picked up happily in Scotland mm. uh, to uh, turn against Englishness, open up the cinema to the popular, and also to look at it, if I may say so, through European eyes. So it was the two areas of culture that the English had traditionally despised, or rather kept at arm's length, mm. European ideas and uh, American popular culture. And my generation, you see this very, very uh, much reflected in the Edinburgh programming, uh, turned against that English, an English parochialism, which of course has got us into deep trouble over the last couple of years, uh, and there is a real movement against it there. You see that with the celebration of the American cinema, and you also see it with the, with the uh, way in which the 70s itself was a radical cinematic uh, uh, decade, um, and we could talk about 16 millimeter perhaps in a minute, but 16 millimeter made a real difference. It really allowed this explosion of new cinema to take to take off, uh, and also the running throughout like a little common thread was how can the cinema um, experiment with a radical politics and a radical aesthetics. So once again, there was that sense of trying to weave together these different, uh, different traditions. To try and sum up the changes that were uh, there in the cinema that we were seeing at the time, was that you could say it was the first time ever that women had made films with the context of women and cinema being articulated as a critical theoretical concept around and about them. So you could say that uh, um, um, the, the women's liberation movement provided its own radical context for these films and enabled them to be made in a certain kind of way. Uh, and so in 1975, um, Yvonne Reyna's Lives of the Performers, which I mentioned a moment ago, was shown, but also her film about a woman who. Uh, the London Women's Film Group's uh, Amazing Equal Pay Show, uh, which I'd like to just mention in passing, as uh, it was, Claire Johnson was a really important inspiration behind that film, which although it wasn't successful, embodied a really interesting idea that Claire felt that um, alternative cinema shouldn't just be radical and experimental, it should also be entertaining. So 60 millimeter synchronized sound um, made it possible for uh, a kind of new wave within experimental film itself. Uh, experimental film had often, as in the US in, in New York 1950s had been very much non-sync and its interest in materiality stripped away everything that was not to do with the materiality of film itself. So 60mm sync sound kind of compl complexified 
uh, that situation and opened up the door to what the issue of October called the New Talkies. And uh, so, for instance, um, Michael Snow had been gradually moving towards sound, if you look at wavelength, a bit of synchronised sound, and then the very extraordinary play with sound. But then in 1975, he shows Rameau's nephew, which he actually describes uh, in the catalogue as a talking picture. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning Michael Snow because he was a very. He, he, Jean, um, Chantal Ackerman mentions him as an influence on, uh, on Jean Dielman, which I can talk about a little bit more. There's a real structural uh, sense of um, uh, engagement across the two, uh, the two films. Um, so there's a sense that 16 millimeter allowed experimental film to talk. And so there again, you get that transition towards the speaking of emotion and interpersonal relations, which is opened up by uh, women's cinema as a new, uh, as a new area of, uh, of interest. And I think it's also interesting that although we're celebrating 100 years of 16 mil, this moment when it exploded into the experimental world and really changed the whole um, possibility of making films lasted for really quite a short time. So if we think of the early sync sound as really early 61, 60, 60, 61, and then by the mid 80s, it was already beginning to go uh, dec go into decline uh, with um, um, the rise of video and so on. Um, so it's a fascinatingly short history. I feel very definitely looking back on it that if it hadn't been for this uh, atmosphere, the movement, uh, the movement in the UK around experimental film, the Independent Filmmakers Association that started in uh, 74, there was a real sense of, a, of a, a movement across the scale of different kinds of politics and different kinds of radical film. And I th without that, I don't think that we would have made films at all. As it was, we moved from writing essays about film uh, and making theoretical um, interjections, as it were. So, for instance, with visual pleasure and narrative cinema, it wasn't only a critique of the um, ways of seeing in, uh, in Hollywood film, but it was also a plea for this new cinema that was actually coming out and coming, uh, beginning to be made. And I do actually say in the essay, bit that looks a bit over, overlooked, I say now with 16 millimeter film, a new era can start. So I specifically pointed to 60 millimeter. But thinking back to that John Dielman moment and what was striking about the film, very often I say it was its courage. Uh, it was completely, relentlessly brave. Uh, there was no unnecessary compromise. There was no, Chantal Ackerman was giving no thought to what might or might not be said. She was doing precisely what she and her cinema wanted to get on the screen. And I again feel retrospectively looking back that once again, it was that moment that enabled uh, this step into a, a kind of, into a void, into an unknown that having mentioned all the other remarkable films that were shown uh, at the festival at that time, her Jean Dielman stood out. And I've said many times in various essays, there was, I, I, one had the feeling there was a before and after Jean Dielman, as there'd been a before and after Citizen Kane. And so there was a sense that one was seeing a landmark film. It is slow cinema because it's a slow film, but it seems to me that perhaps it would be 
advisable to think of it, not as slow cinema as an aesthetic, but a slow cinema because it had to be slow. It was about the rhythms of uh, domesticity and about the rhythms of an ordinary woman's life in whom the perfection of um, cuisine à la française, as it were, that absolute exquisite, um, uh, almost fetishistic devotion that we see in the film to the kneading of the meat, to the pre preparation of the escalop de veau, uh, everything, uh, was going to be recorded by Chantal Ackerman for the first time ever. Mm. So she was bringing the gestures of domesticity that she'd seen, as Mark pointed out, in her own domestic life and the life of her father's sisters, her aunts. And she was bringing that anthropological knowledge into a strange mixture with this kind of Freudian study of uh, a particular housewife's um, obsessions. Mm. Yeah. Like she's not only bringing those actions to the screen, those domestic actions, yes. but she's allowing them to play out in real yes. time. Yes, and then they have to play out in real time. And then um, that emphasis on time then actually changes the cinema itself. Or So I've argued, whether anyone agrees with me or not, because my argument is that um, cinematic time uh, extended beyond the natural rhythm of convention, suddenly draws the spectator's attention to the passing of time. So duration itself actually appears on the screen, and the temporality of the um, event filmed takes on its own power. Uh, and so that the movement between the moment of registration and the moment of exhibition and spectacle start to become interwoven and confused. I, I'm not really that into lists and lists of greatest films, though I do think it was a fun habit that was started, I think, by the Cahiers du Cinéma, who every year did their greatest films of the year, um, which I think Sight and Sound just kept going alongside the big po pole uh, ten, every ten years. So, but at the same time, when I was writing the uh, the little piece on Jean Dielman for Sight and Sound for uh, for the topping the pole event, um, I did begin to think about why these four films, uh, why Bicycle Thieves, Citizen Kane, Vertigo, and Jean Dielman, not so much in terms of what were they the greatest films, what does it mean for them to be considered the greatest films. But more, what was it that attracted critics to them? And was there any magic substance that might connect them in some way that critics saw them and saw these films as standing out? Now, um, you might say, oh, well, Laura would say that, wouldn't she? But it seemed to me that there was a really quite striking um, subtext of psychoanalytic, of reference to psychoanalytic um, material. These films are all portraits. Uh, you could say the first one, Bicycle Thieves, is a portrait of Antonio and Bruno, but it's a portrait of a father, particular father-son relationship. It's crucial at a kind of explosive moment in that relationship. And the uh, psychoanalytic element is very much there. Citizen Kane, need we say any more? Um, I mean, famous for the fact that um, the scriptwriter, the director, based, uh, um, building up a portrait of an actual recognizable tycoon who everybody would know who was being referred to, but gave him a completely fictional unconscious, uh, completely invented uh, uh, an unconscious that would explain his weird uh, habits. So the unconscious in Citizen Kane, I think, is of the essence, whether it's his collecting 
whether it's his fetishistic relationship with Susan Alexander, whether it ends up with a little snowstorm, but the unconscious is there. Um, Vertigo, again, one of the great portraits of uh, the male fetishistic unconscious that has ever, ever been made. And I often think it was no accident that when I wrote Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, that Vertigo was the film that I referred to most, because Hitchcock knew what he was doing. He was making a film about a voyeuristic fetishist. And there, Scotty's unconscious is what the film is about. Mm. I also think when we get to Jeanne Dillon, this is a portrait, once again, uh, of a woman in a particularly oppressed situation in which uh, habit, gesture, and so on, is keeping um, madness, in a sense, at bay. And as Chantal Ackerman herself points out, that uh, what the film traces is the moment where the parapraxies, uh, the lost actions, begin to break down the defence, her defence, and her unconscious kind of sweeps into her every every day. So this is not to do with the greatest films, it's just to do with the way in which critics might unconsciously themselves have been attracted to these extraordinary cinematic portraits of uh, the unconscious at work and also thinking about how the cinema itself is a medium that can invisibly and without mentioning it actually trace and record and celebrate the workings of the of the unconscious mind, and humanity's madness, as it were. Well, we're going to we're going to spend the next five days immersing ourselves in many visions of the unconscious, the unconscious um, mm. here at Cinema Rediscovered. But thank you very very much, Laura. Mm. Well, thank you, Steph, Mark. It's been lovely to talk to you. <laughs>